sisters. <laughs> I am Katherine Collins, and as you just heard, I am an investor. That sounds a little more confessional than it used to just a few years ago. We all have seen now complete proof that our investing in financial systems, they're not as robust or resilient or just as any of us hoped that they would be. And yet I love investing. Investing at its core to me is a creative, connected, engaged endeavor. It is in service to our communities, to our planet. And I think we're all investors. We invest every day as consumers. We invest our time, we invest our energy, we invest all of our different resources. And every time we make one of those investment decisions, we have a choice, we have a vote for the kind of world that we want to see. And so it's with that expanded and, in my mind, that true nature of investing in mind that I want to introduce you to two of my favorite friends. This is the HP 12C. Now, most of you, luckily, will have no need to ever know what this device does. <laughs> but this was in my pocket throughout most of the 1990s. It's a financial calculator. It does a very small subset of things, but it does them really well. And the thing I love about this is it kind of was its own secret language. You really did need to learn secret codes in order to use this device effectively. And that meant that every time you picked it up, you actually had to think. You had to think about what you were trying to figure out, and you had to think about what all the inputs into that decision might be. Now, this is what's in my pocket these days, like many of us, and it does an awful lot more than that HP 12C ever did. So I can see real-time news and stock quotes, every market, every security in the world, real-time for free, something I never dreamed was possible back in the days of the HP 12C. And when I get bored, I can do all kinds of other stuff, too. <laughs> so this is a really fantastic advance, right? The sheer amount of information and data that is available to us, not just investing, but in almost every field, has exploded. And if investing is a kind of exploration, it, it's like our maps are better than they've ever been. They're more complete, they're more accessible. This is a tremendous advance in many ways. The only challenge is I don't actually have to pay too much attention to my questions anymore. I can just surf through this sea of information and feel like I'm informed without having a whole lot of my own volition involved in the process. So as I mentioned, our maps are better and more complete than ever before. And yet, in investing, like everything else, there comes a time when you get to the edge of the map. You get to this area where it says, there be dragons. And unfortunately, you usually don't know it until you see the dragons. <laughs> you think you're still on the map, the part of the map that you know, the part of the map you're comfortable with. And this, to me, ties to what I think is the most important investment issue of our time, not just for financial investing, but for all of those decisions that I talked about before. And that is the question of risk versus uncertainty. So the easiest way to explain it is risk is a situation where you don't know what's going to happen, but you know the range of possible outcomes. So if I ask you to guess a number between 1 and 10, you might not know the exact number, but you know it's between 1 and 10. So if you have enough information and some basic mathematical skill, you can actually figure out risk. You can find a way to approach it that is rational, that is predictable, that is responsible. It's really great. Uncertainty, though, is really tricky. It looks like risk on the surface. Here, too, you have a situation where you don't know the outcome. But with uncertainty, you also don't know the range of possible outcomes. So when I think of risk, I think of a nice, easy curve. So do it with me, risk, risk, right? Nice, easy curve, totally manageable. When I think of uncertainty, I go like this, right? So again, do it with me, you'll never forget. Risk, uncertainty, right? <laughs> uncertainty is nuts, it's out of control. It might feel good at first, but it's terrifying. You don't really wanna pick uncertainty, and so we have this huge tendency to treat everything as if it's a risk, as if it's manageable and analyzable. This might be a neat academic distinction, but for me, it ties really directly to an important time in my professional career and, and in my life. A little bit before our giant financial crisis, I had a mini crisis of my own. Uh, my funds were underperforming by 10 times more than all of our fancy risk assessment tools said was humanly possible. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> And so I did what everyone would do. I pulled out my maps, right? I pulled out every tool. I worked harder. I worked longer than I ever had before to write the ship. But sure enough, it kept going. And I realized, oh, 
I'm in the land of dragons. I am off the map. I need a whole different kind of tool to get me back on course. And it's only now, in hindsight, knowing that things turned out OK, and they actually turned out OK in a short period of time, although it wasn't evident at the moment. It's only now that I can admit, this wasn't a tough time. It wasn't a dark time. It wasn't a difficult time. It was terrifying. And in a professional environment, you're not really allowed to say that you're scared. And I was. I wasn't that scared of losing money. I wasn't that scared of losing my job. But I was terrified that people had trusted me to do something that it turned out maybe I couldn't do. I was terrified that these maps that I had relied on for so long and perfected and, and, and cherished actually weren't true. It's a horrible, horrible feeling. So luckily, I found three different paths that kind of led me out of this darkness. One path was people. I turned to my colleagues. I spread out all my maps. I explained all my analysis to them. And luckily, one guy looked at me, and he kind of tilted his head and said, you know, Catherine, I think this might be one of those times where we need to re-examine our basic assumptions. And I had skipped that and gone straight into the really deep analysis. So this was fantastic advice. The other person that helped me during this time, surprisingly, was Darwin, who obviously I have not met. Uh, <laughs> I was in London, and I was finally reading Darwin in the original. I'm ashamed to say, never did it here. And for 20 years in the business environment, I've been hearing survival of the fittest. Grr, you know, and, and usually that was, that was combined with some sort of exhortation you know, to be faster or stronger or smarter or better, occasionally meaner. But it turns out Darwin was really specific about what he meant by fit. And he said, it's not the strongest that survives. It's not the most intelligent. It is the one most adaptable to change. And to me, this went right back to the question of risk versus uncertainty. I had spent so much time developing these great maps and tools for areas that were risky. But I had spent almost no time developing my capacity to adapt. So this was really helpful advice as well. The second thing that I used uh, to see my way out of the wilderness was divinity school. This question of how do you navigate uncertainty led me to study it. And a funny thing happened when I decided to go to divinity school. Everyone was very supportive, but in a really peculiar way. My friends in finance kept saying things to me like, we're so glad you found your calling, which sounds really pleasant, right? But it means, see ya, you know, good luck over there with that thing. And then my friends at Divinity School kept saying things like, we're so glad you've seen the light and joined us. Which again, sounds kind of friendly and welcoming, but at its heart is a very divisive statement. And so I realized these two groups pretty desperately wanted to stay separated from one another. And I wanted to do just the opposite. I wanted to unite all of these different fields of knowledge. And so I realized that this is still not a very universally popular idea. But I did get the chance to study uh, courage at Divinity School and fear. One of my favorite lessons was a lesson in linguistics. And we were just looking at root words and comparing bravery versus fear. And the root word for bravery is, is face. So it literally means uh, strength on the outside, like a shield that you put up in front of you. But the root word for courage is cur, French for heart. It is strength from within. And again, this came straight back to risk and uncertainty for me. In a risky time, bravery is great. You can use all kinds of tools and manage the risk that's out there. But when you sail into uncertainty, when you sail into that land of dragons, you really need courage. You need strength from within. So I found this source of courage in a kind of unexpected place through the honeybee. Uh, during this dark time, in my professional career, I met Dr. Tom Seeley, who studies honeybees at Cornell. And specifically, he studies honeybee decision making. And the first thing bees do when they have a really important decision to make is they leave the hive. They do not stay at their desk later and later every night, making bigger and bigger spreadsheets, hoping that the answer <laughs> is somehow going to come to them. They go out and explore the world. So I tried to follow the advice of the honeybee. And eventually, it led me to the study of biomimicry. And the idea with biomimicry is that if we are looking for an adaptable, sustainable, regenerative world, what better map could we possibly have than the natural world? And yet, I have to admit, until this honeybee for myself, 
Nature was that thing over there that I went to to escape my professional concerns. It was not a source of wisdom that I was trying to integrate into my day-to-day -day life. So at the heart of biomimicry is this deceptively simple question, what would nature do, right? What would nature do here in these circumstances? How would nature perform the function that I'm trying to perform? And the very fact that there's a question mark at the end of this, I think, is quietly revolutionary. You are not starting with an engineering blueprint. You are not starting with a predetermined answer. You're not even starting with a deadline. You are starting with open inquiry. It is a really different path to take. And our patron saint today, E.O. Wilson, has this great quote that reflects everything I love about looking to nature and biology for inspiration, but also for deep wisdom. He says, our sense of wonder grows exponentially. The greater the knowledge, the deeper the mystery. And to me, this reflects everything I love. You have this wonderful, deep, fact-based science that has analytical rigor. And underneath it, there's more. There's mystery, there's art, there's even poetry. It's not either or. It's, it's all of that. It's both combined. So I want now to introduce you to a couple of my newest friends. This is the leaf cutter ant, keeping company with my HP 12C, but not in my pocket. Uh, the ant, actually, I thought for the longest time that you see these pictures is very popular scientific image. They don't eat these leaves. They take them back into the nest, they chomp them up, they add some enzymes and some fertilizer, and they turn it into goo, and then that goo turns into a fungus, and the fungus is what they eat. So talk about supply chain management, right? <laughs> I mean, think of all that we can learn just from this one little creature. And this is a sea slug, a nudibranch. Now imagine the life of a sea slug, right? You are squishy and nutritious and completely defenseless, and you're living at the bottom of the sea surrounded by predators. It's a really precarious position, right? But the nudibranch, instead of just hiding, in many cases, is able to absorb the toxins from the environment around it, and it uses those toxins for its own defense. So when I think of a topic now like risk management, I still think of our fancy algorithms, and they are helpful. They have their place. But in addition, I think of the sea slug, and I wonder, is there some element here that I could actually incorporate into my own process that will protect me? instead of just building bigger and bigger walls and trying to flee at the first sign of danger. Now, you might have noticed that in all three of my past, there was this theme of reconnection. Reconnecting to people, reconnecting to spirit and ideas, reconnecting to nature. And reconnecting sounds really easy when you think about it just with your head, but when you actually try to do it, it turns out it was a lot harder than I thought. So there are three elements I wanted to highlight here for you today. The first one is reframing. It's pretty easy to understand that you know, any one individual is a small piece of humanity. Humanity is a small piece of the gigantic natural world. But I realized my day-to-day -day actions weren't actually reflecting that understanding or that belief at all. I would wake up, I would flip on my phone, I'd check my emails and my stock quotes, and off with the day. So now I try every morning, first thing, to go outside even if it is winter in New England. <laughs> I go outside, even if it's just for a minute, and try to really reconnect, literally, tangibly, with my place and with my own situation within that natural place. The second element is refraining. And I don't know about you, but pretty much since birth, I have been trained to be as quick and clever as humanly possible. If you put a puzzle in front of me, I want to solve it. I want to solve it fast. I want to solve it right. I want to solve it now. There is joy in that for me. Uh, and again, I've been trained, uh, gosh, over 40 years now to do exactly that. But to learn from all of these sources that I've been working with, to learn from other people, to learn from deep ideas, to learn from nature, we need to quiet that cleverness. We need to sit still and be able to observe without desperately seeking an answer right that very moment. We need to be able to take things in that might be helpful in three weeks or three years or three decades, and maybe not in the next three seconds. This is a serious uphill battle for me, but I think it's one worth focusing on. And then the final element is this, this idea of reclaiming, at least for me. And with that, I want to share with you one final friend. This is the mycelium. If you pick up a log in the forest and you see that fuzzy white stuff underneath, that's what it is, is a fungus. 
And for a long time, we thought that mycelium thrived by just pulling in resources, water and nutrients from the forest floor around them. And that's partly true, but only partly. Mycelium also give back resources to that same ecosystem, and they transport water and nutrients over gigantic distances sometimes underneath the forest floor, from areas where there's great abundance to areas where there's scarcity. And then more recently, we've discovered they also transport communication signals. So if a tree is under distress, it can send out a chemical signal through the mycelium to the other trees, and they have time to muster up their own defenses. So all that crazy stuff in Avatar, it turns out was not nearly crazy enough. <laughs> the reality is so much better than that, right? And I know it might sound strange to take professional inspiration from a fungus. But when I look at this mycelium, I see a system of reciprocity. I see a system of effective exchange and mutual benefit. I see a system that is optimized and not maximized. I see a system that is regenerative and not extractive. I look at this mycelium and I see great investing. And so it's with that courage, that courage that comes from the mycelium and all the other tools that help chart that uncharted territory on the map today. That's the courage that gives me the strength to stand before you and say, despite all of our problems, that yes, I am Catherine Collins and I'm an investor. Thank you.